Welcome to the recorded version of Technology and Caregiving, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Homestead Senior Care. Okay, our presenter today is April Ibarra. April is a dynamic leader with over 25 years of experience in healthcare and aging. She is a strategic accounts manager at Homestead Senior Care and supports the organization's mission through collaborating and creating partnerships that develop impactful relationships for the Homestead Network. April has a master's degree in gerontology and her career has been dedicated to improving the lives of older adults by advocating, educating, and delivering solutions to help them live their highest quality of life. And with that, I would like to turn the floor over to our presenter here this morning, April Ibarra. Welcome, April. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Steve. And everyone, thank you for joining me today to learn about a subject that I am very passionate about, and I think you must be too. I see we have a really large audience today. We're going to be talking about technology and caregiving. And when we put this presentation together months ago, as you can imagine, we had no idea how much the world would change in just a few months and how technology would catapult in its importance to connect with each other and also help to serve our aging population. So I'm very grateful that you joined me today, that you're taking time out of a schedule that is not normal. And I wanted to just quickly thank each of you for contributing to making this world a better place for older adults and their families. There's no doubt that we're living in a different world and we've all seen the images on the news of quarantined seniors and facilities waving through the windows at their families who are unable to visit them due to restrictions, something I don't think we ever could have prepared for. And we're also experiencing in our own lives how to stay connected virtually with families through FaceTime and Zoom. I think there's been a lot of creativity and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of grit for each of us to get through this. And what a perfect time to talk about technology. Uh, you know, I love seeing the physicians and healthcare providers using telemedicine now to meet the urgent needs of seniors at risk, of, of really everyone at risk, not just seniors. Last night I observed a nurse using FaceTime to connect with a family because um, they couldn't get in to see their father who was in the hospital. And also uh, a woman giving birth and her family couldn't be there. So technology connects us. And that's more important now than ever. And I would assume most of you are getting used to technology and most likely you're working from home and, and getting used to all this new uh, devices and, and technology that we can use. I have always been passionate about what technology can do to help older adults and caregivers. And now I have to say I'm obsessed. I want to help find things that can complement the human touch. Technology interventions are going to be a critical um, item to manage the growth of our aging population. But what I care most about is, can it help older adults live safely, independently, and with dignity across their entire lifespan? That's what gets me excited. I'm the number one fan of older adults, and I support anything that is going to make their lives better, which in turn is going to make life better for caregivers. And when we think about technology, it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, kind of think of this presentation before the last few months, before the COVID pandemic, and now. So I'm really kind of focusing on a broad term of how technology can help us with our aging population. Technology interventions are going to be critical to manage the growth of our aging population. Um, and um, the technology is defined as the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. I like to focus on the idea of practical application of technology. Or another term that I love is innovative solutions. Because let's face it, in today's time, we have to get innovative. Technology in healthcare and aging is not new. But now it's really moving to the forefront. And I think we're going to see a lot of activity. Uh, we know that with high tech and high touch, together we're better. So let's kind of talk a little bit about the objectives, and I'll try to stay uh, as, as focused on this as I can in light of so many things that I want to talk about. But we're going to talk about barriers to older adults uh, using technology. 
we're going to list, it says 10 technology products. I'm going to talk about a lot of technology products. Um, and we'll provide you additional references as we go because there's a lot of things I've uncovered uh, since this was put together. We're going to describe the importance of smart and safe technology use, and we're going to dis discuss the importance of combining technology with the human touch, which is what we need now. Um, all right, so Jaren technology, how many of you have heard of this term? It was first developed in 1990 as a response to two different trends. So we've been moving in this direction for a long time. One, we know that there's an increase in the number of older adults. No surprise. I think we're moving a little bit slow, but I'm glad to see us moving forward. We also know that there's a rapidly changing technology environment. So we need to combine these two. So study of aging and technology for ensuring good health, full social participation, and independent living throughout the entire lifespan. You may also hear terms like age tech or age technology. Uh, it doesn't matter what you call it. We're combining the needs of our aging population with technology. According to the AARP, Americans over 50, which I'm in that category, are expected to spend, spend $84 billion annually on tech products. Now, you can imagine that this has got the interest of some of these tech companies who want to be a part of this market. But why is this so important? Why are we even talking about technology? According to AARP, 90% of people over 65 want to stay at home. But also, more than 12 million Americans need assistance with activities of daily living, and those numbers continue to rise, especially as we get older. Will there be enough people to assist the care needs of our aging population. I would assume most of you on this call are in healthcare, so what I, I would assume you probably asked yourself that as well. The demands and the cost for the needs of care in the future are really unsustainable, and we need to p uh, a plan that's going to utilize how to uh, add technology to expand our capabilities to support the aging population. We're seeing that right now in healthcare as the demands on our healthcare uh, system are like no other. Um, the exciting thing about this topic and the important thing is that aging experts are now being sought out um, and advising these tech companies on the needs and the considerations for development that will enhance the lives of older adults. And this will help to innovate products that are meaningful and useful. Without a uh, aging perspective, technology is just technology. And it may not be useful to older adults if the innovation has not been adapted to meet the needs of seniors with changes in vision, hearing, mobility, cognition. Let's face it, they do have different needs. Along the way, I found a lot of great resources. We're going to talk about a lot of different things today. But I would definitely want to reference uh, Aging in Place Technology Watch which is a blog by Lori Orlov. Uh, and also, there's a woman um, who has a program called the Jaren Technologist, and she has a, a resource called the Age Tech Market Map. We'll make sure you have all these resources. Her name is Karen Etkin. So there are some experts out here who are looking at products on a daily basis who can advise us. So just know that there's a lot of resources. Today, we're just going to get you thinking about how technology can help and um, we'll provide resources as we go. How many of you saw the Super Bowl ad for Google? I wish we could have played this, but we weren't sure if it was going to work. So I know you know which one I'm talking about. Every time I see this ad, I cry. And to me, this is how technology improves the lives of older adults. Hey, Google, show me photos of me and Loretta. She hated my mustache. And she loved scallops and going to Alaska. She loved tulips. Technology helps this husband remember his wife. And to me, that's priceless. So when we think about engaging older adults in technology, let's think about ways it can benefit them and improve their lives. Ways that it can help support the caregiver by offering peace of mind and reassurance when they can't be there how it can provide real solutions to a problem using an innovative approach. 
I mean, let's face it, it's 2020. At at some point in our lives, we thought by now we'd see flying cars. So when we think about technology and aging, you know, we hear lots of things about robots and and other things that really just seems a little out there. Um, And it's not that out there. But just remember, we're just trying to use real solutions to problems and make lives better. If any of you have ever been to the CES uh, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas annually, you'll know that there are thousands of new startups of companies each year, and they all have big ideas. That doesn't mean they're ready to deliver that big idea. So we have to keep that in mind as we explore what's available to help our aging loved ones. The purpose of Jaren Technology. I love this reference here. Uh, It's not just about designing big buttons and loud audio, right? Um, I worked for Philips uh, Lifeline for more than 10 years, and I think about how the technology has advanced over time from big garage door opener pendants with a red help indicator. I mean, what could be more fun than that? Um, And now we have sleek, advanced GPS models that allow seniors to be safe wherever they go. Developing innovation for older adults must include them in the design. For example, a lot of older adults do not want to wear a medical alert because there's a stigma associated with needing help. We would often get requests to modify the design uh, at Philips over the years, but we improved it. But we had to keep the form and function in mind because most of the clients that use a medical alert are probably mid-80s. Therefore, their needs for using that product are different. And so when you're designing products, you have to keep that in mind. When you're selecting products for your clients, you have to keep all of those things in mind. How many of you heard about a title of a session at a recent Hims conference? The title was Monitoring Grandma, Adoption of Connected Health Tech for Seniors. I'll just sit with that for a minute. I don't know how you feel about that title, but personally, I think it's ageist. And it's a clear indicator of why we must combine gerontology and technology in order for it to be successful. Sustainability of an aging society is going to depend on our effectiveness in creating technological environments that include assistive devices and universal design to innovate independent living, social participation um, for older adults in any state of health, comfort, and safety. So that's kind of what we're we're looking towards when we start talking about uh, technology. I came across some really good examples of poor design, and I'm sure you have a lot too, so I'm I'm dying to hear them. But one was uh, a gentleman had gotten a new scooter, and he was really proud of the technology. This thing could get him anywhere. It had all kinds of great features. It helped him be independent because it helped him to ambulate. But when it came to charging it, he found that the, the charger for this scooter was in a place that he couldn't reach because he would have to literally climb underneath the scooter or turn it over which, as you can imagine, was not real useful design for this gentleman. Another example, there was a high-end senior living community I found, and it was just gorgeous, all the features that anybody would want, but the smoke alarm was embedded in the 12-foot ceiling because that was cheaper than a wall panel. And when that battery was low, you all know that that sound, that chirping sound an alarm uh, makes when its battery is low, he couldn't reach it. So here was some great design for somebody to live. They had all the features in the senior living community, but he couldn't get up to change the battery. So there's all kinds of examples for, um, you know, poor design, which is, again, why we want to talk about, you know, what we're looking for, for good idea, uh, for good designs, and how and what is the purpose of technology. So I think this is a great list of the many ways that technology can benefit older adults and caregivers. And again, I recommend to start with the problem you're trying to solve. Otherwise, it can be really overwhelming as uh, you start to look at different things, but you really need to focus on what is the problem? What is out there that could help my client or my family? And we know maintaining independence is huge. Um, Living independently does require the ability to perform some basic activities of daily living. And sometimes um, those things get more challenging. Technology can assist 
including things that support good nutrition, hygiene, medication management. Uh, so supporting seniors' ability to do more things on their own is, is a wonderful tool. And we'll dig deeper into these uh, categories as we go. But just looking again at what is the point? What are, how are we using technology for seniors? Supporting well-being and health. Uh, this can be supported by social engagement tools like GrandPad for video chats, for families who can't see each other uh, due to long distance or time constraints, or now we're all isolated. I personally don't think anything can replace the personal connections, but when we do need to fill the gaps, technology can help, and we're all learning that every day. Um, cognitive health. We know that there's a lot of changes that are common during aging. Um, and these changes can affect the ability to live independently, and they may also increase the risk for personal safety. So technology can really hold a promise to help the older adults monitor changes in their cognition, keep them safe uh, when they could be at risk, and also there's a lot of tools for brain training and uh, games like that to keep people sharp. So there's a lot of things related to cognition. Individual and social ambitions and needs. Um, you know, again, you know, I'm a gerontologist, but I'm not a clinical gerontologist, so my background is not nursing. It's actually wellness uh, and prevention. So I come at everything from the aging perspective. And we have to remember, one of my biggest pet peeves in, in this space is that people want to clump all older adults into one big category. And we know we can't meet that. We can't do that. Uh, somebody who's 60 years old is different who, than somebody who's 80. Uh, somebody, you know, there could be 100 people who are 60, and they're all different. And the needs do change within 60, 70, 80, 90 on up. So we can't clump them together. An example, you know, of this might be, uh, you know, you want to provide um, an iPad to your to your your mother who is home and she's active, and, but, uh, you know, she's not very socially connected. Um, so you might have a risk for, you want to connect her virtually, but you maybe have a risk for her or maybe a concern for her getting online. Um, is she going to be, um, you know, privy to, uh, you know, scams and online um, concerns? And uh, maybe she's able to manage that, maybe she's not. So all older adults are going to be different. If somebody has any kind of dementia or cognitive, we want to protect them at all costs. But remember, we can't put everybody in the same bucket. We also know that social and cultural environments are all different. It's no different in anything you're doing for aging. It's the same. We have to keep in mind that people have unique needs. We also recognize that older adults face communication challenges just as a result of hearing loss, but also through social isolation and loneliness, um, especially in um, you know, economically distressed and rural communities. And we also know that social isolation has become a huge concern even way before uh, the, the crisis that we're going through now is going on. And we know there's a negative impact with isolation. They can be as great as smoking 10 to 15 cigarettes a day. That, that just kind of blows my mind. And, um, you know, a lot of people are lonely and they smoke as well. So that's a big risk. Technology can help communication, social connectivity. Enhancing dignity. I am guilty of wanting to protect older adults, and I know you are too. I'm preaching to the choir. But we have to remember that if a senior has the ability to make their own decisions and do things for themselves, they have the right. Everyone craves, deserves dignity, and wants to be autonomous. So we have to um, respect that and not limit what people can do for themselves. Uh, I read an interesting article uh, several decades ago. A couple of prominent psychologists wondered whether giving nursing home residents a little bit of control over something in their lives would have uh, a positive impact on their personality. So they gave plants to half of the residents in this uh, facility, this community, and they were told that they were responsible for taking care of those plants. The other group got the plants, but were told that the staff would take care of it. So uh, three weeks later, the plants were all doing great, but the difference was the group had, who had been given personal responsibility rated themselves as more alert, active, and vigorous. 
So dignity is important. And um, I personally like anything that is going to help seniors and minimize the risk of dependency. And then, of course, most importantly uh, for the caregivers is uh, technology can support them. Um, caregiver, there's a lot of resources to support their role, and really what they're looking for is peace of mind. Um, helping them to have tools to keep their family safe really takes a lot of stress off of the caregiver. So I think it's important that we do talk about what is, you know, what is going on with adoption. How willing are seniors? And I would say, based on the research, uh, seniors are very willing, but they do need help. So we have to realize that someone in their, uh, you know, upper 80s and 70s, they didn't grow up with a tablet in their hand uh, like a, a young adults today. So learning is possible, but it's not going to be second nature. Um, I've seen a lot of intergenerational programs popping up that match seniors with student seniors uh, to help them uh, learn to get online, text, post photos, and build friendships. And I think those are great types of programs because it also builds friendships and helps to reduce and uh, minimize uh, isolation. And let's admit it, most of us aren't tech savvy. You know, we're all going through this crisis together. Most of us are working from home. And the first thing I say to IT on a help call is be patient with me. I'm willing to learn, but I, you have to show me. And, and seniors are no different. So we need to be patient. So I don't know if any of these statistics surprise you, uh, but more people do have broadband in their home. Uh, more people are using smartphones. And um, I have a friend, uh, I just moved to a town a few, a few years ago, and one of my first friends that I met is 80 years old. And I just, this, she's incredible. And she was talking about she finally got a cell phone and she wanted to get on Facebook because she knew she would never see pictures of her great, great grandchildren. And I thought that was cool. So she's adopting, and she had to have a lot of coaching, but it's working out really well for her. So again, uh, it, like with this statistic of, of adults 50 and over, well, that inc probably includes most of us. So many times, even in research, they're putting all the older adults together. So bottom line is we know that people are using um, technology, and we know that it can help. So let's get a little bit deeper uh, into some of the ways that technology can help. So we kind of put some categories. Let's talk about health and wellness first. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of different types of things on here that I think can support the health and wellness of older adults, which in turn helps the caregivers. Um, fall detection or medical alerts. To me, this is probably one of the earliest forms of technology um, that we had. And believe it or not, it was founded in the 70s by a gerontologist uh, whose name is Andrew Dibner. And do you know what he was doing when he came up with this idea? He was shaving. He was shaving and he cut himself and he thought, what would happen if I, um, if I didn't get help and I bled to death? And from there, uh, he came up with um, the medical alert. Um, and there have been, uh, fortunately, tremendous advancements in this industry from the early days of help, I've fallen and I can't get up, where you had to push this big button to be connected to a response associate. So now there are automatic fall detection sensors that can signal for help even when the client can't. There are GPS systems that are widely available that allow seniors to be active and on the go and still get assistance if they have a fall or personal safety issue. So kind of removing just the, you know, the simple thought that a, a device like that is just for uh, fall detection, it's really for personal safety. There is even a company called VirtuSense, um, and this isn't on here, but we'll share more information. They do gait analysis to predict who could be at risk for falling, and this allows therapy to intervene and work on strength and balance. This founder had a family experience. Uh, his grandfather was quite well um, and had some declines, had a fall, and ended up dying. And he just couldn't accept that there wasn't technology to help him better predict. What if I had known he was at risk? Could we have had some interventions? Because so much of technology can be um, reactive. So I thought that was just a great use of technology. One thing we used to get at Philips, um, and this kind of goes to, again, the purpose of the, the device and what you're trying to use it for. People would ask, 
um, could the GPS track my client who has dementia? I would have to answer that no, because the intention of a personal uh, emergency response or fall detection is that they're on the go, it has GPS. If they have an emergency and have a fall, um, they would be able to get contacted to the emergency response center who could find them through the GPS, but only if they pushed the button or had a fall because we had to protect the privacy. This was not something to say, I want to know at all times where mom or dad is. So I use that as an example that you have to find the right technology for the problem you're trying to solve. What are the barriers to adoption for so many products is stigma. Wearing a medical alert button sends a signal to the world that I am old and I need help. But fortunately, with newer technology and everyone using technology, uh, I think seniors are more um, anxious to be a part of it. And I used Fitbit as an example. Um, I started wearing a Fitbit years ago. I don't think they're the most attractive thing in the world, but it helps me manage my health. So it's useful and it's meaningful. If I can wear this, then certainly, you know, technology that can help a senior that maybe doesn't look super attractive, they'll start adopting that a little bit more. There's a lot of technology in the home, uh, especially for fall detection, because, you know, this is not a fall detection, um, you know, session. But what, are, what is the number one reason why people end up in the hospital uh, and, and needing more care is a fall. Um, caregivers are extremely concerned about the fall. Um, so technology that can help with fall detection and help with safety are very, very important. Um, there are some companies now, uh, AlloCare and Smart Caregiver Solutions, that actually have sensors in the home that the older adult does not need to wear that just monitors um, uh, fall detection and alerts the caregiver and a call center. Uh, they can also alert things such as, um, did the coffee maker come in in the morning? I know that if mom gets up and have, has her coffee, she's on her way. Um, I have to also reference sometimes some bad technology, so I apologize if anybody from Tango Belt is, is on the call. But this type of technology is actually, um, it's, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's a personal airbag that deflates when you fall. So I think it's an example of a, a good idea, knowing that when seniors fall, they have hip fractures. But we have to um, think about technology, what's, what's the use, and are seniors willing um, you know, to engage it? I don't know many older adults um, who would be willing to wear one. Again, I love the technology. I just don't know about the compliance. Um, as we talk about telehealth, I mean, I don't even need to talk about this. This at a time when social distancing is among the major measures used to fight COVID, telehealth is stepping up. Um, and it's not new, um, but reimbursement was always an issue. It wasn't widely reimbursed, but that is changing. Uh, President Trump authorized an expansion of Medicare that would cover telehealth. Uh, allowing um, older adults access to care without leaving their homes, which is important now. Um, before the pandemic, only one in 10 patients used telehealth. And today, some of these providers are reporting a 500% increase in business. And again, because things are changing and uh, people are now engaging and we're, there's an ability to pay for it. Smart homes are, are just fantastic. This is technology that's been around a lot, and we all benefit from it, from O2 alarms to smoke alarms. Uh, but there are uh, alarms that can be put on the stove that can turn the stove off automatically. There's ways to uh, alarms that will just turn the sto stove off altogether, alarms for the doors. Uh, there's many, many, many different easily affordable and um, easily, you know, um, you know, installed interventions in a smart home uh, that can really help uh, alert the family before there's a crisis. When technology can help us be proactive versus reactive, that's a good thing. So before, you know, uh, dad escapes um, and he's got dementia and he's down the road, daughter's going to know that door's been open. So that's, that's just amazing technology. Medication management we know this is a huge issue. Uh, medication adherence is a $30 billion issue. 
and it's one that is a major concern for caregivers and healthcare providers around. There is some incredible technology out there that is available to help. Uh, a couple that I looked at were OmCare and RX Pen. Um, these are pill dispenser hubs with two-way two -way video, three-way calling, uh, and lock medications, reminders. One of them even, even has medical alert built into it. Um, and so these um, are great tools. Now, uh, pricing, I don't have pricing on all of these things, and I'm not here to promote a company. I'm here to talk about the, uh, the, the right technology that's out there. We're going to get there. More and more of these things are going to be covered and available. Um, but again, we're just moving towards let's get this technology available to people who need it. Vital sign tracking. We know that many of our older adults are living with chronic illness, um, and healthcare has always been interested in how do I better manage these patients. Um, there are patient monitoring programs that allow virtual check-ins that help to extend the time between a doctor's visit and, um, you know, and, um, and avoid an unplanned hospital. Remote patient monitoring tracks vital signs. Uh, blood pressure, uh, O2, weight, all those things to a care team to help manage them before the crisis. Um, and a cost research report surveyed 25 healthcare organizations and found that 38% of those that use remote patient monitoring programs for chronic disease, they reported reduced hospital readmissions and also uh, lower costs. Um, so everything's going to change. Um, so much of this has been available, but now we're really going to start to lean in heavily on how we can start to some of this. Um, another product that I found in my research was one that I had not heard about before that could be important um, as we move through this crisis is virtual depression screen. Uh, this was a tool that used the voice uh, and algorithms to identify depression. So what it would do is, you know, have a daily check-in or a weekly, whatever it was, with a family member. So let's say the daughter is concerned. Um, they could, uh, would ask mom a couple of questions and they would record her voice and these algorithms could identify depression. Again, let's be proactive. Let's figure out what's going on. And let's try to help things. So, um, there's so much vital sign tracking and, uh, and wearables available for diabetics, um, for people with heart failure. I, there's a lot of apps that I kind of researched that I tried. Some of them I weren't real thrilled about. Some of them were very useful. Again, we have to recognize that even though there's a lot of technology out here, is it useful? Is it relevant? So caregivers um, have their own needs. And caregiving often calls us to lean into love when we didn't know was possible. Um, and that's a quote that I love. All of the resources we have talked about so far will help the caregiver because they support their older adult. But caregivers, as you know, have their own issues that keep, keep them up at night. 64% per, of caregivers do use at least one digital tool to manage their caregiving responsibility. So uh, a few things are listed on here uh, in addition to some of the products we've talked about. Online care coaching, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, geriatric care management type tools where uh, a family can subscribe to these to sort of guide them. Um, voice activated reminders, that kind of goes back to some of the things I was talking about with those home sensors. They can have some reminders, take your medication, mom, um, and also send alert to the family. Um, so there's so many tools, mobile care coordination. There's a lot of companies out there who are doing some very neat things with just trying to manage the schedules. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about activity tracking home sensors as well. Um, there are so many of these, and as I was re researching um, all the available ones, I really uh, love and call them invisible companions. Because again, in my perspective, we want to respect the, the older adults. And if I was, um, you know, the, the the mom, and somebody was trying to track what I did every day, I wouldn't be too thrilled about it. So I think how we introduce this uh, technology, you know, is important. Again, look at the need, look at the problem, find the right solution, and do that to, and protect the dignity, but also the safety of that older adult. 
So I, I wanted to look at some of the tools uh, for dementia and wandering because obviously that's a big concern. And a lot of what I found um, when I looked up that resource really was uh, technology that was designed for finding lost items like your purse or your cell phone. Um, and those were called Tile and Track R uh, or Tracker. Um, so there's a lot of things out there. Um, again, you have to sort of look at, you know, what does the, this technology do? How reliable is it? Who designed it? Um, so there's so many things that can help the caregivers. Chair beds and alarms. Um, if you're, you know, concerned about uh, mom or dad getting out of bed. Memory phones. Um, there's just a lot of things out there. And again, today's purpose is really just to introduce this topic, but also start to dig through what's available, um, you know, how does it work, and is it relevant. A couple that I really liked uh, as far as sensor solutions, one was called Caregiver Smart Solutions. Um, and these had sensors within the home that can track normal patterns for an adult. And then the caregiver can check the app. Uh, and know that mom is up, such as she had her coffee, or yep, the TV was turned on. Uh, this uh, solution or this innovation actually won CES 2020 Hottest Startup, um, and I thought that was that was pretty cool. It has different kits with different sensors, and there's an app. Uh, there's another one that's called Forma Safe at Home, um, and I also mentioned Allo Healthcare and LifePod. Uh, so there's a lot of that type of things out there that I think are low. Um, you know, kind of low-tech interventions that can really make a big difference. Um, some of the um, apps that I found for helping to coordinate care were CareZone and Care Village, and lots of helping hands. So just know that there are apps that can help uh, coordinate the family, take the burden off of one, uh, put in mom's, uh, you know, physician's appointments, all her information and keep everything in one place. So there's a lot of things out there to help. And then we take a look at how can technology help the social and cognitive issues. Um, and again, loneliness is not an aging issue, uh, but it does impact the elderly in a negative way. Uh, many older adults across the country are struggling with feelings of loneliness and isolation and a lack of regular companionship, according to a research of a new University of Michigan poll. And uh, these feelings were common for those who struggled with physical or mental health. Um, and again, it's a big concern. So anything that can help uh, to connect people with uh, others is very good. And then when we start looking at the, um, you know, the cognitive and the uh, issues, you know, there's a lot of things that can help. Uh, again, some of the companion apps. Uh, virtual reality was kind of a surprise to me. I wasn't, I didn't think that that would be relevant, but a lot of assisted living communities uh, are using this type of thing, and they can really tie in ways to take memories back. Families can recreate videos and stories uh, and really, really use virtual reality as a way to engage that, uh, that person, especially somebody with dementia, and, and have them, uh, you know, enjoy those memories all over again. Um, we've certainly seen uh, artificial intelligence as a way, the Alexa, the Amazon, uh, the Google Home, as a way to uh, remember my wife, uh, who loves scallops. Um, products like GrandPad um, that have, uh, you know, help families stay connected um, with video and messaging and uh, pictures and games. So there's so many different things out there um, to help. And I really think that technology holds a promise to help reduce isolation and loneliness. But it is never a substitute for uh, human interaction. So we've talked about a lot of this already as far as independence, keeping in mind that we all have different wants and needs uh, if we're a care provider, if we're a caregiver, if we're the senior. So, uh, you know, simple things such as magnifier readers. I mean, I know personally uh, my vision is just not what it used to be. I do more um, audio books now than ever, so I can still enjoy, uh, you know, reading. Uh, my aunt has issues getting to the grocery. Now she uh, goes online and, and puts her grocery, grocery list into Myers and can get things delivered. Um, you know, I have a neighbor who doesn't like to cook, and she's by herself now that her husband died. She has food delivered food delivery kits. Uh, there's so much available uh, now, uh, 
and, and while this doesn't seem like high tech, it is technology. Think about Lyft and Uber. When could you ever just pull up your phone and say, hey, I need a ride. You know, I want to go to, um, you know, church and I don't have anybody to take me or I want to go to the grocery store on my own. Um, these are all things that um, are very important. So there are some considerations for technology and aging. And, and again, um, the issues in the past has been that technology has not been created with the older adult in mind. That's why now we have gerund technology and age tech. Tech companies recognize that they can't do this on their own. They have the innovation, but if they want to be successful, they have to link in what is a provider need? What are the considerations I need for a senior? Um, so it's an exciting time, and I think we're really moving in a great direction. Um, and, you know, in the past, I gave you some examples of poor design. We cannot just put things together and, and expect that seniors are going to, um, you know, embrace it. What are seniors wanting and looking at? Well, visual appearance, appearance is one. They don't want to wear something that looks like they need help or use a product that makes them appear old. They want it to be functional. Uh, they want it to be affordable. It needs to be sustainable. I don't know about you, but uh, you know, there's so many different platforms and different things that I'm using and different passwords. If that's overwhelming to me, that's probably going to be very overwhelming to our older adults. And then seniors also have privacy concerns. Why am I putting this information in there? Who's going to see it? Who's going to use it? Uh, and most of you probably saw something today on the news about Zoom and how um, you know Zoom meetings were invaded by, or they had a good term for it, but you know people were basically hacking into people's meetings. So privacy is a concern. Again, caregivers are looking for different things. They want to monitor, track, coordinate their loved one's care. And they're looking to find care options. So uh, if you're in any of the uh, providers, you know that people are going online. They're searching, comparing. They want to have videos that show them everything at a touch of a button. Um, they want to connect with professionals. Um, they don't want to have to go to somebody's office or have a care manager come to their home. They want to go online and get the, in the convenience with their time constraints. Um, and they want to share and get feedback from other uh, caregivers. There's a lot of virtual caregiver support groups and a lot of great things available now. And they want to learn how to uh, deliver better care for their loved ones. So we all have our own um, needs. Barriers to adoption really come down to a couple things. Is it usable? Um, is, it, um, you know, is it meaningful to me? Our literacy at different ages is different. We didn't grow up with these devices. The terminology is different. We have to uh, teach in a way that they can learn. Uh, you know, again, those biggest concerns for seniors are data management and privacy. They're not real happy with uh, going online and having to put information they see that's private. And again, they want to have a design that is focused on them. And we know that they don't have a lot of confidence in their use uh, of computers and things like that, but they're okay if 40%, 48% uh, of them just need someone to show them how to use it. So it's not that they don't want to, they just need a little help and we need to understand to maybe modify our teaching and our language so that they can um, understand. And what about acceptance? Again, um, I, it's no different if you're 20, 30, 40, or, or 90. Um, we're all going to use products that we think are useful and easy to use. Um, so uh, this uh, technology acceptance model really is important because um, people will not use technology. You know, you, you can't just say, hey, Dad, this is a great tool for you. I think you should use it because if the uh, consumer doesn't feel that way, it's probably not going to be uh, engaged at all. And I think we have to, as we're, as we're speaking with older adults, remember that how do we get them to accept the help that they need? You know, I desperately want to put, um, you know, new smoke alarms or I want to get mom a tablet so she can video with us or whatever it is you're trying to offer. We need to involve the older adult in the decision-making process. We don't make these decisions on, on our own. We need to offer options for them and give them some different choices. We need to acknowledge their concerns. 
what is it that, why are you so afraid to get this or to do this? And we need to discuss possible outcomes. You know, if you were to fall and couldn't get help, uh, what would we do? We've talked about a lot of these. Again, just referencing some different caregiver technology solutions. So I'm going to kind of go through this because I know we're getting short on time. We want to have time for questions. So most of these we have already addressed. Uh, I'll be offering up some additional resources that I included today since uh, I've learned a lot since we put this together. Um, in, in, in closing, too, we also want to talk a little bit about being a smart tech, tech uh, provider. So we know that, um, or a tech consumer, we want to do our research about the innovation. How long has this company been in business? Is it a startup? Is the product available? And who has the, been, the product been designed and tested for? So I think those are some good questions to ask yourself um, as you're selecting technology. And we also want our, our users to be safe. And we know that, uh, especially in this day and age, there's a lot of room for, um, you know, for things to go wrong or people to be scammed. So using strong passwords, using privacy settings, reporting abuse, uh, sharing with care if you're online, and being aware of scams and knowing that if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, again, we've talked about so many of these, but I think these are some great quotes for families who are looking and, and finding good solutions uh, with caregiving tools. And um, so I hope this has been uh, helpful. And then finally, we know that and we hope that technology will never replace the human touch. People do need people. And there is no technology that can take the place of human interaction. I just want to close real quickly with a quote from Bon Jovi because uh, he's been all over the news this week with what he's doing. And in this time and everything we're living with, if you can't do what you do, do what you can. And I think that's just great advice when we all feel like we wish there was more we could do. Um, so I think at this point, um, we'll probably open it up for questions. Okay, thank you very much, April. Really great presentation, really important information. It is time for us to get to the Q&A. And if you want to send in questions, do so at this time, everybody. And April, let's just jump into it right here. Um, first Hi. question for you. How to deal with the challenge of a loved one not having access to internet or Wi-Fi where they live? Yeah. Boy, isn't that a, that's a good question. Uh, I think we're going to start to see a focus, and I know many communities, um, you know, are, are, are looking um, in their communities to try to expand broadband, especially in areas like rural areas or low-income areas. So um, that's a challenge um, that I think we're going to see uh, resolve itself shortly, especially now with everything that's going on. Um, but that's where I think in, in normal times where we can get out to libraries and other places, um, you know, we have to find creative ways to, um, to stay connected. Okay, thank you. Next question, is there, are there any easy and not so complicated apps for older adults to use in terms of ordering food and other social needs during the stay at home order due to COVID-19? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know how user friendly, I, I would have to reference my Aunt Joy, who I mentioned before, who is now ordering her groceries online. Uh, she's not the most tech savvy, uh, but she is doing it. Um, so I think most grocery stores, um, you know, are doing a good job of providing delivery um, during these times. Um, I don't know how user friendly, you know, I don't have any research on that, but I think that's a great thing. Again, you can help seniors. Get, first of all, setting up the account is probably the most difficult part, uh, getting all that information in there. But that's a great uh, thing for a family to do with a loved one to help them uh, keep moving during these times. Okay. Um, next question, April. Do you have any recommendations for older adults who are hard of hearing and also have mild cognitive, cognitive impairment for telephone or video conferencing connecting with professionals? There is limited tech capacity. Well, that's a good question, too. Uh, that's I didn't use a lot of references for that on here, but I have seen a lot of things. So if it's okay, if I take that note offline and see if I can find any specific recommendations for that question, if that's okay? Sure. 
Um, I believe your contact information is in the slides. Is that correct? Yes, that it is. Okay. Yes, yeah, so everyone. If, if you... The other thing I would Great. reference on that is I talked about Lori Orlov earlier and her web blog, which um, I don't think we got into the slide, so I'm going to share that. Uh, I traditionally start with her. Um, was that Aging Tech? Um, can't find it now. Uh, yeah, Aging in Place Technology Watch is a great blog. So uh, again, what she does is really take a look at all the different technology, um, and you know she's an aging professional, and make recommendations for many, many different types of things. So that's usually where I would start. So I'm going to reference back to that for a lot of those types of questions. Okay. Next question, April. What about older adults who are fearful of technology, those who want to have nothing to do with technology because it is unfamiliar or unknown to them? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, it, it comes back to, again, what does, the old, what does the older adult want? You know, maybe there's something that they'd like to do that they can't do based on some changes in their own life. Um, so it starts with their own motivation. I know personally, if I'm not motivated, I don't learn. If if I'm motivated, I can learn just about anything. So I would say, hey, you know, what is it that, that you really, really miss? Um, well, I miss, you know, going and playing cards with my, my buddies. Okay, how about we try to get you on, that might, may not be the best example, but how about we, we you know, connect you with some, some game apps that allow you to play games with some of your, uh, you know, your buddies that you used to see every week. Um, so I think you start with the motivation, come at it from their perspective. Um, nobody wants to change. Nobody wants to learn things. So you have to sort of start with what is it that you want and then work your way back from there. Okay. April, do you have any suggestions for teaching seniors how to engage with tech while we can't actually go to their homes at this point? Um, well, that, that's a good question because, you know, if you're, if you're not set up, you know, already to do some, you know, uh, FaceTiming or using Zoom or those types of things, um, that's, that's going to be a little bit hard. But you can, you can start with even small things, um, you know, like, um, oh, gosh, I, I, I just think, of, again, I go back to my relatives. Um, I message with my aunt every day. She's not real technology. She doesn't have a cell phone. There's a lot of things she doesn't use. But she is on Facebook, and she does use Instant Messenger. So I take that little open window as my way to communicate with her every day and share things with her. So, um, you know, if you're starting from scratch, it is going to be a little more challenging that maybe you can come up with one thing that you could um, introduce to them that would help. And remember, this is not going to last forever. We're going to be back with each other, and, you know, we'll learn that, wow, there's a lot of things – we need to change in how we how we uh, are set up to to live in order to thrive. Okay, um, next question here, April. What other technologies are you seeing that are being used at skilled nursing facilities or assisted living facilities? Yeah, there's a lot of different things. Um, you know, I including the sensors because you know falls are, are are a big risk everywhere, but especially in an assisted living. A community or a nursing home, so sensors that just monitor people um, so that uh, if they do try to get up uh, and you know they're a falls risk, you know ahead of time, uh, those types of things. Uh, the virtual reality as far as activities, I think there's a lot of exciting things that are going on in that space. Um, there's just a tremendous, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you are, in the home or in the facility, there are resources available, uh, not only for just activities and socialization, but also for safety. Okay. April, how would you address issues for those folks that are very concerned about privacy and security? Yeah, well, yes, everyone is and everybody should. Uh, so I think it just goes back to education. You know, most times we don't understand how things connect, right? Um, you're putting this information in here. So understanding the device that you're using, the tool that you're using, and where is this information? I mean, we should all be asking these questions. So I think it goes back to let's go to the beginning and don't assume people know. You don't say just, oh, put your information in there. You know, it's just required. Help them understand. We're using this device. Here's how it's going to work. This is the data that goes in here. This is how it's being used. So 
so I think just education and knowledge helps uh, resolve some fears. Okay. April, um, do you have any recommendations on tools for organizations that focus on caregiver training and education that are affordable and easy to adopt? Um, I don't have anything that comes to mind, you know, just at the top. There are so many great caregiving uh, resources, and I know, Lakeland, you're online. You're probably on mute. You may be dying to jump in here, and I welcome if you want to answer this question. Um, so I may have to just go back and kind of make some uh, uh, different recommendations on that question because I don't have anything top of mind. But I know there's a ton. Okay. I know there's a ton. All right. April, can you give an example on how or what words you would use when encouraging, say, an 80-year-old person to adopt technology since a lot of services today are easier to use versus the old traditional ways? For example, it's easier to do online banking rather than going to different offices and paying bills in person. Right, right. You know, I think, first of all, we have to respect older adults' decisions. And, you know, I've referenced already that I'm, I'm the worst case example. I want to protect and I want to do everything, you know, to make, make their lives better. But they do have the authority and the right to make their own decisions. So they may decide, nope, not for me. I'm not going to change. However, uh, again, you have to go back to what's in it for them, right? So let's say, you know, uh, your client has been complaining, um, you know, it takes me a half hour to get dressed, get out go to the bank, do this type of thing, um, you know, if that's a problem, then we can start to offer some solutions and help to teach them. And I think it's just um, understanding, first of all, what is their concern, right? So I would ask them, well, tell me what it, is, what it is that you're afraid of. Well, I'm afraid they're going to take all my money. All right, well, let's kind of look at how online banking works and things like that. So it's really uncovering the, the why, the, the what is the meaning behind this behavior. The other thing I would mention, though, and I saw this the other day when I was out, is, you know, that could be socialization for that older adult. So if they can still get out and do those kind of things, for many of them, they like it because they get to interact with others. So just think about, you know, what it is that is going on in that older person's mind. Okay. Um Time for another quick question here, April. I work in technology and would be interested in developing solutions for aging in place. Where do you suggest I should focus first? What are the major trends in ger gerund technology? Mm. Well, you know, I tell you, I would definitely look up the age tech market map, which is, I referenced earlier, that's the uh, Karen Etkin. She's a gerund technologist. You know, she really has a map that kind of has all these different um, technologies that are out there in the aging world, what they do, what they work, and she really helps and works with small startup companies um, to address the needs. So I think that's the place to look. Um, you know, there's so many products. Again, you have to start with the problem. I would definitely suggest, uh, you know, if it seems like a good idea to you, you might want to run it by some older adults and some care providers and make sure uh, that there's a need first. And then you have to talk about scalability and design and cost. Okay, great. Well, April, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour here and we're just about out of time today. But I want to thank you for a really great presentation and this has been really great and helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for joining.